Bonjour à vous tous. Good afternoon, everybody. Many uh, really thank you for joining us. You've selected the best debate, the most interesting. To pick up on what Christine Laguette said, there's momentum. And on the topic we're going to talk about, uh, intergenerational, there's a sort of double momentum. There's a COVID pandemic that has sort of revived or uh, deepened uh, divides and uh, discussions between generations on uh, the economy, health, uh, which have tended to um, uh, favor um, older people or senior citizens and trade-offs, public trade-offs that have uh, actually uh, favored uh, uh, senior citizens' health and uh, the young have uh, the impression of uh, uh, having borne the brunt of uh, the crisis even though we've all been hit. So. Uh, this sort of intergenerational pact or covenant that um, uh, resulted from the Second World War has been called into question. You know, uh, back uh, in um, the 60s and 50s, where people um, really were certain that they were going to be better off than their parents. This has all been uh, upended. Uh, and there's also the um, uh, demographic changes and uh, the financing of that social uh, um, pact or social covenant has also been called into question. So let me. Uh, uh, introduce my panelists. Um, so sitting next to me, Magda Tomasini. Uh, she's at the uh, head of the INED, which is the National Institute for Demographic Studies. So she's worked a lot on social issues, and she's uh, uh, also she also uh, um, leads European centres in uh, population studies. To her right, Pascal Rufnac, who's the, the head of the management committee of Bayer Press Group. Extremely interesting in terms of inter intergenerational uh, issues because they have. Um, uh, magazines and for uh, the youth and also for adults. And he also uh, is very active in a um, sort of think tank, uh, Langlois, uh, looking into forward-looking um, uh, studies and analysis. So uh, Pascal Rufnac will uh, get a chance to discuss that uh, further. Let me find my crib sheet again. Uh, says the speaker, Sylvain Rabuel, who's the uh, CEO of Domus V, is a, both a French and international um, company, 45 staff members, and you uh, provide service for the elderly, um, care homes, uh, and these are also intergenerational um, um, places because uh, younger generations uh, uh, look after uh, uh, the elderly. Next to you, Hervé Le Bras, whom we're all familiar with. He's uh, a regular here at the Rencontre. Um, he is a researcher uh, and uh, he often contributes data, uh, even back in the day where we didn't call them data, and a lot of maps and um, statistics um, tools and instruments that shed light on the sort of social anatomy of France. And amongst these um, uh, analysis, um, there was the issue of intergenerational uh, relations. Uh, I mean, uh Amiela Lanois, you the head of FAJ, which is a uh, students' uh, union, um, very representative today because you have the highest number of um, uh, students uh, um, subscribing. And uh, so they've been very active, uh, and you've been very active in all the proposals that you put forward. Uh, next to you, we uh, have uh, Akim El Kawi, who's an essayist and um, uh, working for the Paris office of Brunswick. Um, you wrote in 2013 a book on the uh, age uh, struggle, uh, and uh, so um, I'm sure you'll have insights for us. And uh, I'll, uh, um, last but not least, Hippolyte Delbis, who's a member of Le Cercle des Economies, he's published a number of um, uh, articles uh, on this topic. So uh, it's uh, uh, only natural that he be with us. Let's start with you, uh, Magda. Maybe to get to kickstart that discussion, we need some data, statistic data. We'll talk of France, but of course, we'll uh, refer to other uh, mechanisms of intergenerational solidarity in Europe, maybe to uh, compare. But with you, maybe we need a, snap, a snapshot. Um, um, so let's start from a reality. So give us a snapshot. Uh, thank you. 
So what imbalances are we talking about here from a, a purely demographic uh, point of view? What about ageing in France? Well, it is an ageing population, suffice it to say, but France is one of the European countries that uh, is actually the youngest amongst the younger ones, and we tend to forget that. So to um, explain that uh, the ageing, well, ageing of the population is a worldwide uh, uh, phenomenon that is part of demographic transition, uh, that is to say, going from a, a society with high in, um, a birth rate and high death rate to a society with low birth and death rates. So, it's, uh, uh, so the, uh, the so family models tend to be more restricted and um, uh, longer life expectancy. This trend is unavoidable, and it is uh, it hits all continents. In France, it started uh, very early on, two centuries ago, because the containment uh, or control of uh, birth started there earlier than in any other European countries. So um, the uh, under 20 represented one third of the population. They now represent 23 percent, that is 10 uh, points lower. And the share of elderly people uh, has gone from 4.7 percent uh, 25 years ago to 9.6 percent uh, currently. But demographic transition, when it's been completed, uh, leads to a, 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 a balance in which the number of births and rates tend to um, actually uh, make you know compensate one another so France uh, has become slowly but surely one of the younger um, countries the uh, um, uh, average age in France is 42 so which makes France one of the uh, youngest uh, is the median age apologies um, and uh, it's 47 in Italy which is a reversal really compared to the in-between wars uh, period where France was the uh, oldest country in Europe and amongst the oldest in uh, the world. So uh, we're moving slowly amongst the younger countries in the EU. And um, the reason why the aging process uh, is uh, going on, it's because of uh, fertility, um, which is fairly stable, slightly under two. And you know that two is the threshold for generations to renew themselves. So in many other countries, uh, that fertility is very much uh, lower in most of uh, EU countries, it's around 1.6 uh, children per woman. If we look at the UN projections, uh, by 2050, the median age in France will reach 46. Uh, for the world population, median age would be 36, and within the EU, it would vary between 44 in Ireland and Sweden to 54 in Italy. Italy bearing the brunt of a longer life expectancy and and fertility rate that is very low. So we would still be um, uh, in, the, in the, a low average. Yes. Um, so, uh, uh, from a purely demographic uh, uh, perspective, we have to um, bear in mind that this is relative. But this, uh, these changes in, in the population uh, are linked to something that is very positive, of course, which is life expectancy. So it's very positive. Let's not forget that. And that question of um, life expectancy uh, uh, goes hand in hand with phases of life uh, becoming longer. So uh, the age where when uh, a woman has her first child tends to come later, the uh, duration of, st of studies um, and uh, working uh, life as well. So this is what we also uh, have to look at. So Hippolyte Delbis, uh, maybe if we um, uh, look at this snapshot, I've often you heard you say Hippolyte, there shouldn't be a war of ages or there is no generation that is being sacrificed. There, uh, there is 
a sort of entry point for young people that is a lot better or more favorable than previous generations, uh, if only because life expectancy is uh, much higher and uh, life is easier than, f than it was for our parents and grandparents. And, and that's what I want to hear you on, transfer between generations that, according to you, ensure, guarantee a certain stability uh, and um, this uh, will probably be debated, uh, uh, and I hope I haven't simplified it too much, but we need to shed light on this dimension. This dimension of transfers between generations uh, uh, in, uh, the, in the way that our social system and social organization has built it. Thank you, Vincent. You've said it all. You haven't simplified at all. Um, you've said it very aptly. I think there's a notion that is very important. Magda mentioned demographics, so um, structure per age, number of um, so the share of um, uh, um, elderly people and and young people. I work a lot more on an other dimension, which is a uh, monetary uh, transfers. We can't hear the speaker, uh, so it is. Uh, uh, quite simple. People uh, who are young enough produce uh, wealth, and this is redistributed across society. So, of course, children, um, you know, cost a lot of money, so hence the transfers, and it can actually uh, go through a number of mechanisms. There are three institutions that are absolutely central in society family. Um, all these uh, transfers between generations go through this uh, nucleus, uh, but there are also states that centralize uh, a great number of those transfers. I'm thinking of pension funds, education system, health care system that is very costly uh, indeed. And a third channel, if you will, that would be the market via savings, because when you don't uh, uh, consume straight away and you save money, it's money that you can benefit from later on in life. So it's a transfer also between generations. What I've done for a number of years is try and quantify those different transfers. We have uh, great data produced by our National Office uh, for Statistics. Uh, and um, we find that every generation uh, has been able to benefit uh, from uh, this uh, uh, in uh, each phase of their lives. And uh, we try to uh, add this up and to uh, pinpoint how much um, each and every one of us um, uh, earns uh, in, uh, or, or, or makes uh, in terms of money uh, in, in their lives. So uh, pensioners uh, or the 60 and uh, over, uh, they get a lot of money from public funds, uh, but they also pay taxes. So you have to subtract one from the other. And so if we look at someone who's over 60, on average, they're going to make uh, a little bit over 15,000 euros. That's the state share. And that amount has not gone up over the last few years. It's tended to go down, actually. So the, the state, it seems, um, uh, helps, uh, has helped uh, less and less uh, the uh, uh, elderly. So if we look at the over 30, uh, or, uh, sorry, the the, uh, the the younger uh, share of the of, of the of the population. So uh, of course they do not they they pay very little tax. They benefit from um, child benefits and uh, um, um, sometimes handouts for uh, linked to education. And this has gone up. So. Um, we could argue that the state has never actually um, stopped making good on its commitment to the youth. And then we can look at uh, other categories that, uh, for example, the 18 to 25 year olds, which is fairly specific. If you look at net figures, they're uh, going to uh, benefit, but not that much. And at the end of the day, their consumption, and we can see it in the studies, it will be um, um, financed uh, through two uh, different channels, uh, either through themselves or through their families. 40% of the consumption of that age group is financed by uh, in uh, um, transfer within the family and that youth is does not depend on the state or it, it's not 
independent either, but it's not really related to the state because it's uh, mostly linked to uh, families. And this is where the uh, inequality uh, uh, comes in because some uh, can be uh, helped more than others. Uh, and uh, But there's also another type of inequality uh, within the same generation. If I compare myself to, the, to other people in the same age cohort or the same age group, I don't really believe in comparing yourself to other age groups. And you can actually experience that yourself. Um, uh, we tend to compare ourselves a lot more to people within the same age group. So I look at inequality indicators per age group, and I realize that over time, that form of inequality has increased. Um, even though inequalities as a whole have tended to be fairly stable, but inequalities within the same age cohort uh, uh, have tended to increase. You're telling me to stop, so I'll conclude. On a more political uh, level, I not in favor of universal uh, measures such as an income for all young people, but I would be in favor of uh, measures that would correct inequalities, inequalities uh, uh, that people who are within the same age cohort suffer from. Uh, I'm sure we um, it will be uh, fuel for debate in the in, um, uh, the rest of our panel discussion. Should we have more targeted measures or more global measures? Um, but that's another story. Um, so uh, I introduced uh, you, um, uh, Aniela, uh, as the uh, head of the FAGE uh, Student Union. So you represent students. You've been very active during the crisis, the pandemic, and we can see very clearly that that generation uh, that is at, uh, was uh, at, at the beginning of their uh, cycle um, uh, of uh, training, uh, they've suffered a lot. And when such a, a severe economic crisis uh, occurs, I'm thinking back to uh, 2008, those who were still in training or trying to get on the job market uh, paid a very high price. Uh, it is uh, absolutely essential, the impact on these people who are very close to getting uh, onto the labor market. So I'd like to hear from you what these uh, what students have to say. Well, yes, very, very, um, thank you very much. Well, we've heard it said that uh, being 20 in 2020 was probably uh, not easy. Um, so yes, uh, we've we've heard it a lot, um, you know, uh, on TV, on the radio, that being 20 today was not uh, no uh, easy thing. Well. Um being 20 is never simple, uh, whether you're in a pandemic or not. The, what the pandemic has highlighted is the lack of security of uh, students. Uh, it uh, didn't come uh, in 2019. Um, it's uh, for years we've seen that um, f food, uh, you know, uh, um, food banks um, have seen a lot of students uh, coming. So maybe the pandemic has revealed to those who uh, were, weren't aware uh, that what was happening. So, uh, so the youth, I'm not saying it's been, uh, you know, they've been sacrificed, but investments were not really uh, effective and maybe not exactly adapted. So uh, we can discuss that uh, some more. We have uh, propositions uh, with the, the FAGE of measures that could be more adapted to the situation of each and every one of, of us. Uh, that uh, insecurity among students, so I've talked to food banks, uh, so it was food insecurity, but there has been an impact on their whole uh, academic um, path uh, and, uh, and their, their, their training. When you can't really um, eat enough, of course, it's difficult to um, stick to your studies. So we've had a lot of people dropping out. And um, uh, and, and one hour down the line, 84% uh, uh, of students uh, were close to dropping out. There's also, there's also been a lot of psychological pain. Uh, um, uh, so the pandemic, the health crisis, has been, uh, uh, 
you know, more painful and has impacted more as uh, students, but the pandemic was not the main factor, I would say, that explains in and of itself um, insecurity for students. But maybe to strike uh, a, a bit of, uh, more of a more positive note, it's also um, unlocked uh, a lot of uh, solidarity. And uh, so I'm going to talk about those um, food banks and um, uh, solidarity groceries, uh, grocery shops. Uh, so, uh, and um, uh, we've had a lot of partners working with us, so I uh, can uh, cite Bayar. Uh, so, uh, uh, so there's been that momentum uh, also between generations and awareness. Um, so we were there, students, uh, you know, cooped up in uh, our uh, uh, tiny uh, rooms in student residences. Uh, and I'm sure we can come back to that. But there, uh, there has been a lot of solidarity between uh, generations. And that has really materialized, but it hasn't been enough. And it would be too optimistic. Uh, and uh, maybe uh, would be deluding ourselves uh, to, uh, for me to say that it's been enough. Many students uh, who were uh, uh, on scholarships and, and were in already difficult situations have uh, found it really, really difficult. But they're not the only ones, actually, that have uh, been uh, hit hard. Uh, we find a lot of people who uh, uh, can't actually get scholarships. Um, so uh, we're not asking for the whole scholarship to be completely scratched and and um, uh, and uh, and reinvented from scratch, but we're asking that it be reviewed. Uh, and um, um, also talking about family and family bonds, uh, we have uh, lots of uh, students who can't really rely on a support system with their family that have uh, uh, that are cut off from uh, their, their their families. Uh, so uh, here again, we need to uh, reinvent the, the current system. We need a policy that is uh, really geared towards uh, youth and uh, to that end, we need to listen to young people. And um, I'll wrap up by saying that what we ask for is a, uh, you know, revisiting of all these uh, uh, policies and uh, also um, uh, um, over the last 18 years, we've looked at the costs of, um, you know, going back to, to to school or going back to university. And if we look at the budget items, uh, 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 housing is definitely the number one budget item for every uh, student. So, uh, and. Uh, so, which uh, sums up nicely how interconnected things are, isolation and uh, insecurity. Are you in favor of a um, minimum income for uh, students? Uh, well, as I said, the pandemic has hit uh, students hard. So minimum income, uh, I wouldn't uh, go for uh, the existing minimum uh, uh, incomes uh, because the ones that exist, and I'm hearing of a, a um, guarantee for young people as well that uh, we're talking about, uh, that uh, doesn't seem to be really uh, suited to our needs. Um, well, um, Hakim El Kawi, over to you. I reminded everybody that you wrote that book. Um, uh, so, uh, age struggles, so a war of ages and uh, not a class struggle anymore, but that's the reference, of course. So, uh, to use a phrase that uh, was used in the past, is it an impossible discussion, impossible conversation to have on? Um, the topic of uh, uh, relationships between generations, it seems that it's the hot potato, you know, nobody wants to really tackle it. It's like Pandora's box. Um, and we're in a society that finds it really difficult to also reach a consensus and that is wary of uh, deepening divides and uh, uh, even within political parties. Indeed. Well, um, it's some say that on this topic, uh, everything's looking up. Well, there uh, are signs of solidarity, but if we look at the, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
organization of uh, state uh, support, etc., uh, it's, it's looking pretty bleak. So the uh, average age of people uh, dying of COVID was 82. The world, especially rich people uh, or, or rich countries, uh, everything ground to a halt to uh, protect lives. And uh, of course, uh, that was the right thing to do. What was it financed by? It was financed by debt. 20% um, so, uh, of our uh, GDP was the level of debt. So the question, it begs the question, you know, who's going to foot the bill? Because the, uh, the context is, is uh, fairly specific. Uh, currently in France, when you do not work anymore, you make more money than when you used to work. Of course, that's an average because some people are on very uh, small pensions, but the average um, um, level of pensions represent 110 percent of uh, working uh, people's income. So uh, 20 years ago, or in 1995, the under 50 and the over 60 had pretty much the same property um, in the cumulative term. There, are, there is now 50 percent, a 50 percent gap. Uh, that's, of course, due to the real estate bubble and um, uh, major cities. Now we need to look at the tax system. You know, at the beginning of um, uh, our president's uh, uh, term, there was a lot of talk about council tax being lowered. Uh, but uh, pensioners pay um, uh, less tax than um, working people. And that's the fourth uh, important phenomenon. Uh, people um, uh, assume that pensioners are poor. But actually, if you compare them to other age cohorts, they're rich. Uh, uh, poor, it used to be the pensioners were the poorer, but 7% of pensioners uh, currently live under the uh, poverty threshold. Uh, uh, for children, uh, so family families with children is 25%. So uh, poverty has shifted from one generation to another, and um, so has so has wealth. So we have a system of investment that is completely, um, you know, uh, does not match any more at all uh, the uh, the uh, reality of uh, that distribution uh, why well we are moving from a democratic system to a gerontocratic uh, system who worked for local elections 60 percent more uh, pensioners who votes for presidential elections who votes uh, uh, at the second round the two rounds of presidential 53 uh, percent are over 60. so more and more general interest is dictated by the elderly and we it's never said we never talk about that and when you when you talk about it people uh, you know uh, abuse you you give data you give facts uh, and people tell you but I know of a widow uh, in uh, in Provence that has a, a really small pension so if we look at young people and more generally working people, uh, they uh, really uh, are the main losers of the system. Uh, what is that due to? Uh, baby boom. A uh, baby boom uh, translated into a lot of working people at one point. Uh, that translates now into a lot of pensioners. So we need to rebalance the system because it's uh, uh, it's um, uh, out of kilt. And so it's not only working people that should foot the bill because they can't afford it. But you have to. Uh, um, make it so that pensions go down. You have to lower pensions so that there's more reserve and a fairer system. Thank you very much, Hakim. In what you said, I noted two questions for Aniela. Uh, so, Hervé Lebrun, uh, over to you. I just reminded Hervé that you have a capacity uh, in terms of methodology, uh, in uh, to analyze in a very refined manner the social anatomy, if we might call it like that, of France over the last 20 years. So uh, your um, your take as a historian is very interesting. We see that there are uh, different uh, dividing lines. So maybe let's look at things over time and let looks a bit uh, at things a bit deeper and locally. Beaucoup. Thank you very much. You're asking uh, uh, to me to give you quite an extensive program in just five minutes. The living conditions of generations as they're defined by age classes have changed substantially over the last half century, as Kim's just reminded us of. This is the case for poverty in 48 to 40 percent of people over 64 were above uh, the uh, poverty line. And now it's the youngest who are the poor. 21 uh, percent of people with the median income 
are below median income, and 13 percent of the 30 to 60 and only 8 percent of the above 65. The age classes have also separated in terms of space. In 1917, 27 percent of people of 20 to 24 were living in a city of more than 100,000 against 13 uh, percent in 65. Uh, as in the opposite, in the rural areas, uh, there were 10 percent of the 20 to 24 and 20 for the above 65, 19 percent of the above 65. The, there are what for one person, 20, 24 year old in the same city, there are six for 65 years old. In other fields, the elderly and the young are separated even more. We see this in terms of uh, their own wealth. So this gap would lead to a, a war amongst the generations. But it's the opposite that's happening. In the Eurobarometer, the question, are you satisfied with your family life? 93% of people said yes in France. 57% said they were very satisfied. The percentages are analogous in many European countries. In an IFOP survey last week, 84% of grandparents said that they were happy or very happy as grandparents in their relationship with their children. Two sociologists, Louis Roussel and Agnès Pitrou, provide a key to this apparent contradiction between the shift, the difference in situations between the age levels, the age groups, and uh, the, this uh, favorable attitude to families. This has led to an exchange between generations, parents giving uh, means and resources, and the young people giving their, their social life. So that comes is summed up in the Sunday afternoon lunch. And this has led to an exchange between the generations. Hippolyte and, and other economists have insisted on the intensity of intergenerational exchanges. The attachment of French people is to their uh, inheritance is interpreted this way. The older generations will help the younger generations over time. In the 18th century, on the opposite hand, uh, younger people uh, paid uh, for the older generation. Private happiness, public uh, uh, unhappiness. So the intergenerational conflicts are a way of expressing uh, uh, publicly things that they hide in private. We talk about the fact that young people don't vote while the elderly do. But let me give you a local example here. In uh, uh, Provence Alte Côte d'Azur, in an IFOP survey on the recent elections, the preferences of young people and elderly are very different. 18% of under 25 wanted to vote for the independent ecologists, but only 1% of the over 65 groups, so 18% less. 18% of uh, the young people chose uh, the right wing candidate for a majority of the elderly choosing him. So a central question, choosing uh, Mariani, the extreme right wing, uh, so that's a, a much more worrisome figure. Hakim asked uh, the very important political, political question about uh, voting and about collective choices that are made today rather by the senior generations than the younger generations that weigh more heavily in collective decisions and in the appointment of our elected officials. And uh, so this is a question for Agnella later. I'm not going to hand the floor. To shed light on this topic to uh, Sylvain Rabuel. And your viewpoint is very interesting because you manage a group that takes care of the elderly. And we're at the start of a, an important debate on, de, on the dependency, on the new risks that we're going to have to collectively take on and base it on a, a solidarity measures. So your profession that you're developing, we see with the aging of the population is something that's going to be very important. It's going to weigh in the intergenerational balance. And so we're extremely attentive to what you're going to be saying about your profession and the way that you perceive it, the way and the role that it plays in society today. A group such as ours and our uh, colleagues and competitors, we're all stakeholders in the intergenerational relationship. We provide services and habitat to the elderly. And the professionals uh, who work are, are young people from 20 to 40 years of age. 
and 40 is still very young today. There are 40,000 young people who support, protect, and take care of 70,000 very elderly people. And that's where we see these big categories of the young and elderly don't really mean anything. The customers that we have are over 85, 92, 95 years of age, and they were born before the war, so they're clearly not in the baby boomer or boomer generations that uh, were mentioned earlier. So these two extreme ends of the population are represented. And COVID was a real, really revealed the immense solidarity for us when we entered this crisis in February 2020, one of our real concerns was that people would give up their jobs, that they would be afraid to come into work, uh, afraid of the unknown, afraid of disease, afraid of bringing the disease into their own homes, of making members of their families sick. And in some countries in Europe, we saw this occur where people did not go into work in our professions massive, uh, uh, level, at massive levels. This didn't happen in France. We had a lockdown in France, and when the schools were closed, we were again afraid that uh, people would not come into work. Our teams are mostly uh, uh, comprised of women, a lot of uh, single mothers, unfortunately, so they uh, experienced real material problems. And this, they did not uh, refuse to come into work. That did not happen. So what we saw in this crisis last year was a real commitment to multiply our, a multiple commitment by our young people towards our elderly. So that we see now on an individual level and in the terms of public spirit, there's real empathy between generations, even when people's lives are at stake. These two generations stood together, shoulder to shoulder. And in the COVID crisis also revealed that these two populations, the young and the very old, are fragile populations. And they suffer from the same problems, social inclusion. Young people have a hard time entering their professional lives in society, and COVID hasn't helped them. And the very elderly, we tend to expulse them from social life and society. There's a huge problem of solitude and isolation for the elderly. So these two populations paradoxically share the same level of fragility that the COVID crisis revealed. For me, I call on resolving this problem of systemic imbalance that you mentioned uh, very correctly, and it's our responsibility to vote as citizens. And when we have responsibilities, we need to act to make sure that the intergenerational link is the living. And the, as a company manager that I am, I feel that I have a huge responsibility. And this is my last word. I would like to underscore the question of our, our helpers, our caregivers. I'm in touch with them. Uh, they're the families of our customers. They're 11 to 12,000 in France, and they uh, are wearing themselves out uh, helping their parents and grandparents, and they're receiving very little help. And we as companies have a huge responsibility to, fa to facilitate this for them. We don't need help from the state. We don't need an, an election to do that. So at each at our own scales, we have actions that we can carry out to help make this link between generations. Thank you. Pascal Rufnac, uh, you're the head of Bayard Press, and you wanted to talk about a paradox, a gap between the, the individual personal family feelings that we can have and social perception of this intergenerational situation. Thank you. Vincent, I'm sorry we can't hear him. His microphone isn't working. This isn't very uh, COVID, but here I have my microphone. Between family happiness and social uh, disruption, there's uh, a problem. At, at Bayard, we publish for children and young people from Pomme d'Api and for the seniors. We created a magazine called 
notre temps in June 1968, and there were six years of life expectancy at the time, and now there are 26 today. What interests us is the representation that the people, these people have of their own lives. And the Club d'Andois think tank is trying to find practical solutions to these demographic questions. In the present analysis of uh, seniors, they say, I learn, I work, sometimes painfully, and then finally retirement, 26 years ahead of me, that's great. No, it's, that's not how is it. At 50, there's a tipping point, the second life, François Julien, the philosopher, talks about. I have worked for 25 years and I have 25 years of good health ahead of me. What am I going to do? How am I going to be useful? So there are mandatory rules, taking care of one's children, one's parents. But how can I feel useful for myself, which is what's most important in life, because it gives us a positive view of one ourselves. For young people, does it really exist? The statistics, that, okay, that's great, and thank you for that. But there are also average means. If you look at the PISA results, France's 22nd level in uh, the first target and 40th and the last target, these are social inequalities. There are also cultural boundaries. There are social inequalities that are huge. At Meudon or Saint-Denis, your cultural destiny, your life's destiny will not be the same. There's 20% of unemployment, but in reality, for young people, but in reality, for those who are least helped, among the 800,000 who are graduating from school, uh, 40,000 are completely excluded from the system, and they can't grab on, grasp onto the branch. So we need to reduce these inequalities, these social inequalities, and I don't have an answer, but there are lots of associations who are trying to do tangible things, who are trying to help young people at a cultural level, because we know that's one of the most complicated things to help young people succeed, and it really, we also need to help them financially. We've seen that with La Fage, which is building intergenerational uh, uh, buildings to house young and the elderly together. When you talk to a young person of 17 years of age, when you talk about gender, uh, it's important to them. We talked about sexual freedom 30 to 40 years ago, but now they're talking about gender identity, who I am. It's not easy for young people, uh, for seniors to understand this way of thinking. Who am I? Am I a homosexual? Am I bisexual? Am I gender fluid? Uh, that's a, a real concern for them. And what about ecology? That's a real, in, very important for young people. And the elderly are only vaguely interested in it. So how do we dialogue about these topics? How can we reduce our cultural inequalities and our cultural boundaries, rather? There's an absolute need in our society today to speak to each other, to listen to each other, and this dialogue is necessary with uh, nuance and moderation, and that's not always the case. And I will just finish with education. Education, there's some measures that have just been taking, the first day measures, they're called. A child needs time, needs time to grow up, needs attention, needs safety, security, and the word, the problems come from there. So in this new program, in the first years of school, that's where we learn. It's the difference between uh, children from the lower classes and the higher classes. When you're able to use your words properly, you can express yourself, you can express your emotions. When we talk about socio-emotional competencies, you can express yourself and you can move away from a system that keeps you down and you can move forward in society, in companies, in general uh, life. So in the short term, we need to help young people in, in any way possible through learning in particular. And we also need to help them in the long term. Our little children, we need to take care of our smallest children. In France, we've had this great uh, kindergarten system. It's, it's breaking down now, and we need to support it. We need to support parents also, parental education. How can we support our parents? And this French intergenerational link is very strong, and it's something that we need to nourish in order to help the most fragile populations. Thank you, Pascal. Agnella Lamnawar. Several of our panelists have made reference to what you said. And we're not criticizing uh, our young people. There aren't, uh, we can't say there's one category of youth. There are many categories. I have two questions for you. 
I'd like to ask you about the paradox that was underlined by several of our panelists. We see that the challenges are, are for the youngest generations are very uh, high, and yet the, their participation in elections is quite low, and this is a, a it's a, a strong signal of a systemic problem, the functioning of our democracy. So how do you perceive this need for your generation to weigh on collective decisions and the difficulty to do it in the, the framework of society today? I'd say it's, it's a whole with different levels of reality, a whole for the vision that we have at La Fage, uh, the, the uh, awareness of culture, and of, uh, of our life as citizens, the importance of voting, that's a real thats a real stake for us. And it's a stake within the uh, elections, but it's also uh, important for multi-annual management. Yes, we need to vote. We, we vote in regional elections, and we're trying to encourage people to vote for uh, other elections also. But this is systemic, as it is it often with students. We need to talk about uh, education in, in society. You mentioned gender. Young people want to understand who they are, what we're, they're going to do, and that's already a, a huge step forward. We need to talk more about culture to young people. We need to uh, get young people more in, involved in society, understand its challenges and its differences. In one of our federations, it's called ARES, the Federation, of students in social science, and they partner uh, at some of our events. And it's important for us to be present and to uh, represent uh, and raise awareness. So this question is important everywhere. There are challenges at all levels, and I'm I'm not hiding that it's uh, it's very complicated to act on all levels. But in a diff there's a different time level, and I come back to the example of a of a student who doesn't have the means to eat or sleep, uh, be interested in culture and go vote, and they'll answer, well, I have other priorities and that's not an urgent for me. So we need to look at all of these uh, uh, problems and their timelines. We need to understand that it's part of a whole. And as we open up ourselves, we can invite others to open up to society in general. Hey, Hervé Lebrun, Hervé Lebrun wanted to comment. I agree with what you said, but if we look at the question of uh, people who don't vote, abstention in voting, it seems there's something obvious. What is obvious? The total budget for the regions is roughly 30 billion euros. The national budget of the state, roughly 600 million. There are important things that are being done in the regions, but compare 30 to 570 or 600. It's almost incomprehensible what happened. It, it, it means that the elderly voted because they're used to voting. It's a habit. And young people don't understand why they should go vote. What's the point? Of course, there's the, there are universities, but that was very low in the programs that I read. People, uh, that was not going to mobilize young people to vote. I have a question for Akim El Khwari. Oui. I have, I'd like to begin with a topic we haven't really addressed yet. A few months ago, the uh, Constitutional Court at Karlsruhe took a very important decision. They refused uh, the, uh, a great part of the German government climate plan, saying that it was pushing back efforts on the future generations and that there was a breakdown in the generational covenant and there was no reason to push these efforts back onto the future generations and the young people of today, that we should be making efforts and not just leaving them uh, to the young people. And they forced the governments to make more uh, daring decisions to better distribute the load Will this problem also have an impact on the debate that we have between generations? Frankly, I hope it will have an impact on the debate. 
there are two major debts. There's financial debt and there's climate debt. In both cases, we propose that the next generation pays back the expenses of the current generation, the current generation that is richer than the active generation. So the previous generation, richer than the current generation. The, the previous generation is richer than the active generation today. Second topic, what do we leave to our children in terms of uh, our footprint? Firstly, we need to have a debate on who pays. And COVID, it, which is at the intersection of these two crises, we see that there's a topic of connection. We don't know where COVID comes from, but the Chinese Communist Party uh, made sure that it left China. But there's also the question of uh, climate and deforestation. So COVID, 20 additional points of debt in one year that will have to be paid back by all generations. No one is saying that perhaps we'll finally act in, a, in terms of intergenerational solidarity. From the zero to 60, people have done their best to uh, maintain the health of these over 60. So maybe the over 60 today should ask, how are they going to pay for that effort? How to pay back the younger people for that effort? So the government has tried to separate the COVID debt to n make sure that it doesn't have an impact on the, our current activity, and we're going to get it paid through the French CRDS tax, and we'll pay it back in future. This is also true for cl climate. We need to invest in energy transition, and it can't be done uh, just on credit. The question is, who pays? If we look at the distribution of wealth between generations, we see that our, our retired generation can pay while not asking the people with modest pensions to help. But this is difficult because those are the people who vote. So we're at a, at a political uh, stalemate. In Germany, they've been discussing demographics between since for 50 years. Schroeder made reforms and he got the social debt in Germany to evolve quickly. It's The debt is currently 87% of the active population. And the French pay 90 billion more than the Germans do to finance their pension plan each year. So let's at least have this debate without uh, being criticized or being insulted. Magda, did you want to comment? Yes. Just to come back to what Akim said, in the next 30 years, we know what will happen in, a dem in demographic terms. And we knew that 30 years ago also. We know, and yet we're not doing anything. When we discover that there are a lot of students, well, yes, we knew that 20 years ago they were born. So we have the tools to act, statistical tools that will allow us to act. Thank you, Magda. Hippolyte, what you've heard from the panel, has that encouraged you to temper your optimistic vision of our intergenerational model? What we've heard from Amniela, do you not feel that you're underestimating the difficulties experienced by the youth today, the questions linked to dependence to the climate? Won't that require stronger adjustments to the model? And beyond that, uh, adjustment to the agility that you described. We have a model in what you presented that has demonstrated a certain level of adaptability. It's moved. There's been regulation between the state and the families. So it's not as set in stone as it appears. But to meet the massive challenges ahead of us, can we just satisfy ourselves with a description of an, inter an intergenerational model of transfer that's pretty much doing the job today? Well, obviously not. We're not just going to satisfy ourselves with statistics, and we have to understand what people are saying. And what we hear today has been very nuanced and very intelligent on this intergenerational question. In the previous session, the Spanish minister said that COVID was a stress test for our economies. And what happened is that COVID was also a stress test for our generations. And I feel that we came out of it quite well. It was a year that was exceptional in terms of intergenerational interaction. We were worried about each other. The first people that we wanted to go see was our family, our mother, father, grandparents. So the intergenerational relationship, generational relationship is still there. Now, the monetary and political questions are also behind that.
We would like to have an end of life that's dignified for everybody. It's important. We can't live in a society where the elderly and vulnerable are put in horrible situations of massive poverty. And when I have that figure of poverty for the elderly, which is quite low, I say I'm not going to oppose that to other poverties and other categories. I say that's a good thing. Our system succeeded. They eradicated poverty amongst the elderly, which was unbearable. But at the same time, we have to make it possible for our young people to live their lives and to succeed and to take ownership of their own world and to take up their challenges, the challenges that are their own, gender, climate. Each generation has their challenges. The new one does. It's not easy. They will manage. We need to support them, but they must take them up. My feeling is that, of course, there are people of all ages in difficult situations, but it's not by pushing people against each other that we're going to solve the problems. Hakim, and I just wanted to add something to what Hippolyte said. We're entering into a year of democratic debate, uh, an important year at, in many uh, respects. And the question of intergenerational relationships can be looked at in different ways. The question of certain young people the ability of our public policy to act in favor of certain populations of young people. There's systemic issues. There's the problem of the climate. There's debt. How can this question be raised in the presidential debate amongst all these other problems that have to be managed? I, I don't think you're a candidate. Well, I don't think that this question will come up clearly. Hippolyte said we shouldn't put ages, uh, uh, pit them against each other. But the French system is a system of distribution. The act, our active uh, uh, workers are financing the pension. And I, right now, all I'm saying is the, that there isn't the right balance. There aren't any figures that to go against this, this affirmation. If we talk about it, it's unbearable. So we don't talk about it. And that's what's going to happen, despite COVID. And we say it's fabulous. People are showing private solidarity. Well, private solidarity is great. But we're talking about the socialization of the financing. Who is going to pay? It's a bad financial question. Who pays? Who's going to pay the COVID debt? And I say it's our working population. And it's too bad because pensions will go down. We need to bring them down now. We need to, ha to create financial reserves. We know the demographics, we know what's going to happen, but the people who vote are those who are going to decide to not make transfers in the other direction. I hope that by listening to the panel, you've heard reasons to, uh, to discuss this topic in the coming days and weeks. We realize that it has a very strong impact on society. So, Ipodit, would you, would you like to conclude? We've gone beyond the time that we're allowed. Would you like to just conclude? I'd like to thank our timekeeper. For 10 minutes now, she's been telling us that this debate is over, but I'd like to thank you all for your attention and the different members of the panel and you, Vincent, for having facilitated the discussion. Thank you all. Enjoy the